Do we have questions about chemical and physical changes? You guys okay with that? We talked about that tricky one with salt versus sugar. I can mention it real quickly. Salt versus sugar. Salt is a white solid. Sugar is a white solid. It's actually C6. I think that's right. Uh, and what happens when we add them to water? They dissolve. What happens to the sugar? It stays its chemical formula. What happens to the salt? It becomes sodium ion and chloride ion. We get two things as opposed to one. It's by definition going to be a chemical reaction. Right, we broke a bond. Um, where we would really discover that is by having to practice it enough and have had the experience. Right? So we try to ask questions that are very kind of, I guess the word is dichotomous, where we're completely on opposite sides. We're either strictly chemical or strictly physical. The dissolving salt is very much somewhere in between. Right? It's actually kind of entertaining if you Google that on the internet. You see all sorts of people yelling at each other about it. Hold your hand. Uh, you don't need to know the spectrum. I just want you to be aware of the spectrum. Melting ice is an example of physical. We aren't changing the character of the molecules. All we're doing is changing their spacing. Burning wood is chemical. Mixing red food dye with white cake frosting. Physical. And yet another tricky one. This is an interesting one that I've been trying to make and it hasn't worked out very well in the lab. You can make a yellow crystal, and when you expose it to light, it turns purple. Hmm. Oh, why would it do that? Right. Because of a chemical change. Right. Bonds are changing within the structure and when exposed to light, and it will change its color. It's all kind of a neat molecule. So our kind of whirlwind through chapter three. Physical law, we've got conservation of mass. You cannot create or destroy matter, okay, which we will keep going back to when we look at a chemical reaction. Okay. Um, so if we start with four hydrogens, we will end with four hydrogens. The location of those hydrogens may change. Okay. I may change what they're connected to, but I can't destroy them. Okay. And the reason this kind of law was so difficult, you guys experienced last week okay, with the separation of a mixture. We heat up a sample, and all of a sudden the mass changed. Oh, I destroyed matter. How awesome is that? Mm -hmm. You didn't destroy matter. What did you do? It was last week, wasn't it? What did you do? You changed the phase into the gas phase, and then you didn't collect the gas. Okay? If you had collected all that gas, you could have seen the difference in mass from your starting and ending of the solid was actually due to that gas. Okay? So we have gas reactions. Those tend to be very difficult to monitor. And that's largely why this kind of observation or this law took so long to kind of discover, or not discover, but really define. Right? So mathematically, how could we ask this? Right? For those of you advanced enough to actually do any calculations, stop doing those fancy calculations. Because undoubtedly what I'm giving you is wrong. If I give you two grams of hydrogen and one gram of oxygen, how much water would I produce? I get three grams of water. That's conservation of mass. Okay, I cannot create or destroy that matter. What if, on the other hand, I said, we produced three grams of water, but I only started with, uh, I want to do fancy numbers and I won't, um, two grams of hydrogen. How many grams of oxygen reacted? One. Okay. And the mass must be the same on both sides. Okay. So let's take it up a notch and let's move to the next question. I give you two grams of wood and three grams of oxygen. How many grams of gas are produced? Silence is a good answer on that one. Okay. We can't solve for that. We need to know 
the mass of water to figure that out. Okay. We have two unknowns. I don't know how that mass is distributed between those two compounds. All I know is that the mass is there. The total mass of the gas in the water is 5 grams. Okay. That's all conservation of mass gives us. As we layer in more information from what, in, or like what stuff is actually stashed in our balanced equation, we can start to determine those masses. But we can't do that until we have more information. Okay? Yes? So if I burned a tree down, and that tree, the ash of that tree was like 5% of what the original tree was, the rest of that mass turned into the smoke again? Yeah, if we burned a tree down, we're going to end up seeing probably a little bit more than just gas and water. We'll probably see a little bit of ash, stuff that didn't burn out. Okay, so we compare this out to a larger example. Yeah, you take the mass of that tree however many hundreds of thousands of pounds, and we get a couple pounds of ash. All that difference in weight went into water and gas. All of it. Okay? And that's, again, why this observation or why this law was so difficult for people to track. Because you start with a 1,000-pound log, and you only end up with a little bit at the end. You're like, oh, well, I must have destroyed matter. We didn't destroy it. It just went into a phase that isn't easy for us to monitor. Okay. Einstein came along and then added to this and recognized that energy and mass are related. Okay, which means if I have the conservation of mass, what do I also then have? Conservation of energy. Conservation of energy. Right, that's really all we're really getting out of this. We could go through and run calculations with E equals mc squared. Uh, and as exciting as that may be, it's not. We aren't going to do it. What you're responsible for realizing is that energy and mass are roughly the same, which means if I create one or if I have some energy, I can change and mutate it into something else, but I can't destroy it. Okay. Anybody know what it typically gets changed and mutated into? Heat, thermal energy. Okay. For the engineers, that's largely what you fight against. Okay. <clears throat> so there's our law of conservation of energy. We have six forms of energy. We already mentioned one of those being heat, okay? which isn't very sciencey, so we call it thermal energy. What else do we have? Kinetic. Kinetic uh, is not actually going to break down in this. Yes, that is energy, but that goes more towards mechanical energy. Okay? So mechanical energy, we could differentiate out into kinetic and potential energy. What other forms? Chemical, what would you say? Light is a form of energy. Where did we get the light from? Electricity. Okay. So we've got light, we have electrical, okay. we have a whole bunch. What do we got? Heat, light, chemical, electrical, mechanical, and nobody mentioned it. We also have nuclear energy. Okay. So we've got a variety of forms of energy, and most of what we do as humans is to try and get all of that converted into electrical energy that we can then dissipate out and control. Because we have ways to control electrical energy a little bit better than we can control the others. So we'll take light energy from the sun, convert that into electrical energy, okay, using technically chemical energy. Once we have that electrical energy, we can store it and wait to release that to put the light where we want it to be, in say dark places. Okay. Or maybe to generate heat so we have heat in lecture rooms when it's already really warm outside. Okay. We're just trying to take ways to convert those things from one form to another. Okay. And one of the things that I did mention, when we're going through and looking at these different forms of energy, particularly as humans, we will almost always do that conversion and lose some of it as heat. And the heat one we have the least control over. Okay. Least. Okay. Look at your car. What eventually happens to your car? It overheats. It, overheats. it gets too hot. Okay. Where did all that heat come from? The combustion chemical reaction of the gasoline. Okay. You are riding on an explosion when you get into a car. We've just controlled that explosion 
okay, to convert that uh, explosive chemical energy into mechanical energy. That conversion resulted in the formation of some heat. What did that heat then eventually do? Heat up the parts of our car too much that the parts swell and then stop functioning appropriately. Okay. Mechanical energy is kind of a fun one. It gets broken down into our two primary categories, as Sky already mentioned, our kinetic energy. Okay. We also have potential energy associated with that. Kinetic energy is the energy associated with motion. Potential energy is the energy of a stationary object. It doesn't necessarily have to be stationary. Okay. It just depends on the direction we're looking at. Okay. Your combustion and engine takes advantage of this. We're taking chemical energy uh, in our gasoline. We ignite it, which then causes the piston to move. We take that piston and translate that motion into the motion of our axle, which then translates to our wheels and moves our car forward. Okay. We're also taking advantage of that same chemical energy when we use a cannonball, because we're igniting gunpowder to then cause a projectile to go flying out of the barrel. Okay. It's the exact same principle. What I find even more fun is if we look in the lower right-hand corner, biologists out there, ATP. What is ATP? Adenosine triphosphate. Okay. It is the energy source or the primary energy currency for life as we know it. Okay. How is it providing that energy? Well, it's a conversion from ATP to ADP. If T stood for tri, D stands for die. All we're doing is removing a phosphate. Okay? So you've memorized your polyatomic ions because you had a week to do that, right? You might, that was kind of a joke. Don't panic. Okay? <laughs> you've got the phosphate ion, complex ion. The removal of that complex ion from ATP generates ADP. That removal produces energy. That energy we can use or our cells use to power various chemical reactions to make things and potentially destroy things. Kinetic energy, temperature, and physical state. So at a given temperature, what phase has the most kinetic energy? Right, so let's switch it up to a different question. We've got some boxes there with some stuff shown in them. What's being shown in each of those? We have a solid, we have a liquid, and we have our gas. How do you know those were solid, liquid, gas? Solids are really tight together. Solids are really tight together, meaning if we try to compress them, what happens? Nothing happens. What happens with our liquid? They move a little bit but we can't really compress them very much. Well, that sounds familiar. And our gas, what happens with the gas? We can push those together a lot because there's lots of white space in between them. Okay? Yes? So the gas ones are moving really fast, and the kinetic is motion, so that So our gas particles moving at all, okay, if we keep everything as a constant species, just changing the phase, the gas particles are moving. Well, if they're moving, that is a form of kinetic energy. So if we were to ask which of those phases had the most kinetic energy, well, the only one that's moving, that would be our gas phase. Okay. What happens to kinetic energy as we increase the temperature? Okay. It moves faster, which means kinetic energy increased. So it's just looking at those relationships, establishing them, and just moving forward with that. Okay. Uh, do all phases have kinetic energy? Yeah. All particles are moving. Okay. That motion may be imperceptible to us as humans, but they do all move. Solids are moving, okay. which is a bit of a bad thing to say because you will answer a question on the practice exam, final, practice final, where it seems to suggest the other. Okay. The exam is wrong. Okay. All particles move. When, does particle, when do particles stop moving? When do we have zero kinetic energy? Remember, we're tracing kinetic energy with temperature. What happens when our temperature is zero? When we achieve an absolute zero, 
we have zero kinetic energy. Okay? Which begs the question, what is absolute zero? We will leave that for the end of this unit if we get to it. Maybe we'll start with it at the beginning of the next one. Okay? So if we reach a point where we have zero temperature, which is kind of a weird thing to say, we will have zero kinetic energy. Okay? This does not mean zero degrees Celsius okay? or zero degrees Fahrenheit, something else entirely. Okay? It goes into Kelvin's, yes. So um, the solid one? So potential energy is kind of an odd term because potential energy is now saying nothing moves, but we're looking at a relative to something else. Okay? Um, so when we think about potential energy, the easiest would be where is my, if I had a bowling ball, let's take my pen, where does my pen have the most potential energy? Do I hold it way up above my head or if I hold it down on the ground, right, you know, right there? Way up above my head because then when I drop it, it has a longer distance to fall, and it hurts my head more. <laughs> if I dropped it just above my head, well, that probably wouldn't bother me at all, okay? Because it doesn't have enough potential energy stored in it. Where else can we reference potential energy? Gasoline has potential energy. That potential energy happens to be also better known as? Right idea? Chemical energy, okay? So potential energy is just what energy could I possibly get out of it? It's not specifying is it mechanical necessarily. Kinetic energy tends to be very much associated with the mechanical or motion. Potential energy can apply to a bunch of different situations. Okay. Uh, energy in our chemical changes. In a chemical change, energy is transformed from one form to another. So if we took a look at water, we could add electrical energy to water. And we can turn that into hydrogen gas and oxygen gas, which is kind of neat. Okay, we could do that for hydrogen fuel cars or fuel cell cars. And it goes, oh, great, we have clean fuel because we produced our energy uh, burning up uh, hydrogen with lots of oxygen. We make water. We started with water. Everything's green, fantastic, phenomenal, no waste. Except where did we get the energy to make the hydrogen? It wasn't just water chilling on its own. What did I do? I had to put electrical energy in. Where did I get the electrical energy from? from a power plant that was very likely burning coal or oil or some other nasty fuming chemical, okay? So it's doing roughly the same thing as if we had just been burning it in the car anyway. Okay? And it turns out our car consumption of gasoline is actually very, very efficient, okay? I'm not saying that's a good process, but it's actually a very efficient one, okay? So to go through and invent a new fuel source that's doing the exact same thing as we're already doing defeats the purpose. Okay. So it's going to come down to how do we get that energy? Could we get a better or cleaner source of that energy to begin with? That's why we talk about solar and wind and all sorts of other sorts of energy because we want an alternative way to get energy in there okay, without doing combustion. We could take that same hydrogen and oxygen gas and we can react it like we're doing potentially in a fuel car, and we release energy. Okay? So this is where fuel cars become fun. We put in electrical energy to convert it into hydrogen gas, and then we convert the hydrogen gas back into water to spit out energy that we could then use to power our car. Why didn't we just start with the electrical energy to begin with to power the car? We have to get that electrical energy from somewhere, and that becomes the question. If we did it as just electrical energy outright, that means an electric car. But we now need a battery big enough to store that energy. That's why people were looking at hydrogen, because hydrogen could act as a chemical fuel, okay, as an alternative. Right? It turned out hydrogen didn't do a very good job, and people that made batteries started making batteries better, okay, that we could store more energy within them. Okay? Why else is this problem process problematic? Yes, we're releasing energy. One of those forms of energy happens to be heat. That heat energy we can't control, which then means we lose energy in the process of this reaction. Okay? We don't get as much energy output that's usable because of that conversion. Okay? So kind of fun little process with our chemical changes. So here's an odd little one to throw in here. 
terms of expense, when is it better to fill your gas tank? In the cool, warm morning or the warm afternoon? Why in the morning? We're looking at temperature. Temperature affects our phases. Okay? So if we look at a cool morning, we're looking more at a liquid phase. If we're looking at a warm afternoon, we're looking more at a gas phase. Okay? Well, when we're paying at the pump, what are we paying or buying by? What unit are we using? Gallons, Gallons which is a measure of volume. volume. If we have a more gas phase, are we getting as much particles? Remember, we're getting chemical energy from those balls. Do we get as many balls in the gas phase? No, we're paying for a bunch of empty, useless space. Right? Yeah, isn't that nasty? Except, before we get too excited about now I'm always going to buy gas in the morning, okay? we're not buying gasoline in the gas phase. Right? We are buying it in the liquid phase still. How much of a difference does that change in temperature affect? Very, very, very little. Like an entire tank of gas cost-wise is a tenth of a penny kind of a difference. Okay. So yes, there's a difference. Maybe over a lifetime you'd save like a dollar. Right. You could probably get find more money just walking around the parking lot. Saving is saving. And yes, there are plenty of people who say saving is saving, by all means. <clears throat> yeah, well, technically, yeah, you are saving money, but not to the extent that we would hope. And we run into other issues then, because we live in Flagstaff. We're now off of a main drag, which then means it takes more energy to get the gas there, which then means you're paying for that energy to get the gas there, which then means <laughs> the price of gas goes up. What was that? Oh, okay. Yeah. I heard less depression. What? <laughs> but yes, you're right. You'd have a lower oxygen content, which then means your combustion is going to change. Okay. Which gets us really quickly, cool, awesome, into the stuff that I really wanted to get into, uh, actually our equations. So we now have an equation, and because again, we've all read the book on our equations. We know what information we can get out of our equation. So what stuff is in that equation? Okay. G stands for gas. So I know I have gases in my equations. That's useful. What else does my equation tell me? L stands for liquid. Interesting. Those are two of the phases of matter. What else do I have in the equation? Solids and a lot of people will call this out as acid. We have to be careful with that. Acids do have AQ. What else do they have? Hydrogen. In that formula that we have shown here, do we know anything about hydrogen? No. So we cannot specify that that is an acid. What does AQ actually mean? Aqueous. Latin, Greek, whatever you want to call it, for dissolved in water. Mm -hmm. Not liquid, because we have liquid already. Aqueous means dissolved in water, right? which is an interesting dilemma then. When we look at this equation, what things are there? Well, A is there, B is there, C is there, D is there, and I don't accept aqueous, but right idea, and water. There's technically five things present in there. As soon as I add the word AQ, I'm implying that water is also present. Why am I not listing it as, uh, we'll get to that, never mind. Can't say that yet. So all of those in red are collectively known as our phases. So phase information must be or can be included in our equations. For the sake of Chem 130, <clears throat> I will probably regret saying this, uh, they must be included. If you have to move into 151 or 152, they will insist that phases are always, always, always included. You're not allowed to get rid of them. Okay. Why? Because someone came up with some arbitrary rule that they needed to be there okay, for general chemistry. With almost any other chemistry, we tend to ignore those phases. Okay. But 
be aware that phases are things we should include. What other information do we have in our equation? I heard a plus. What does the plus mean? And, okay, so you said reacts with. I like that. So that plus means reacts with. So I have another plus over here. Does that really mean reacts with? Right? No, you're saying that one's and. Right? Why are you all of a sudden saying it changes to no longer being reacts with? That's now a bad one, and it just means and. Reference of our arrow. The left side of the arrow is reactants, which means we could react with if we add a plus sign. And the right side of the arrow is products. What does that mean is happening with the arrow? Producing, okay, reacts to become. We're just referencing ways to make something. Okay? Everybody hates this example eventually. We were building a bicycle. Okay? I wouldn't say that I have a bicycle and that makes two tires and a, and a frame. But I might say I take two tires and a frame and I can make a bicycle. Mm -hmm. right? So it's looking at things that we've already seen and trying to scale them down. Why do we have to be careful with how we think about chemical reactions? Well, how big are each of those species? How big? Microscopic. Microscopic. Submicroscopic. These things are on a very, very, very tiny scale, okay? which means we have to come up with a model to represent what's happening at that submicroscopic scale. What do we use? An equation. Okay? Being able to use, understand, and interpret this equation is the same thing as we're using to build a sandwich. How do you build a sandwich? Bread and stuff. Okay, well, that works. Okay? How many pieces of bread do you need? Two. Why are you all saying two? That's how you make a sandwich. You know the amounts of things coming from an equation. Right? You have an equation to build a sandwich. Right? We're using chemical equations to build other chemicals. Use the same logic that you would use in building a sandwich to look at a chemical equation. Right? So other things that we can get. We can get amounts. Where do the amounts come into play? As a coefficient in front, notice there's nothing written there. What does that mean is written there? A one. A one. Okay. What is the charge on A? How do you know that's zero? There's nothing written in the upper right-hand corner. That's how you know the charge is zero. Then why did you say, with there being nothing written in front of A, that it's one and not zero? If you're writing A, then it's there. Okay? By not writing the charge, we're implying a zero. So we are implying information, but we're implying it in slightly different fashions. Okay? If we really wanted to write out and say, well, that also means zero, then you would have to write out every possible combination of elements, every compound ever listed, and put a zero in front of it for every chemical equation. That's not pleasant. So our amount is specified even if there's no number written there. Right. Anybody know anything else or see anything else that's implied up there? So B, C, and D are then implying the same kind of general information that A is supplied. Okay. I don't remember much else. Let's see. Okay, our reaction arrow, there's our producers. We've got our plus. The reacts with is a dicey one to use because pluses show up on both reactants and product sides of the equation. Okay. The two kind of, or three kind of new ones would be right through the middle. We've got an arrow with what symbol above it? 
a delta. Delta represents or is the symbol for change. What are we referencing when we're putting a delta there? Change in temperature or energy. And it is always implied as a change in temperature upwards, as in we are adding energy into that. That's what that delta means. Okay. What's the next one show? We have an arrow with what's written above it. Okay, iron, good. You all jumped straight to the interpretation. I didn't have to make jokes about giants. F-E. F-E, come on, giants. What did, what did giants say? Um, but um, yeah. Boo, yeah. <laughs> what is written above the arrow? We're writing iron above the arrow. Why are we writing iron above the arrow? What's that over here? Uh, no, if the iron is actually reacting, we would actually show that as a reactant. It would show up on the left side of the arrow. And if it was a product, it would show up as a product. So nothing's happening to the iron. Well, nothing's probably happening to a lot of elements. Why are they not listed? What's that? Iron is acting as what's known as a catalyst. It helps the reaction occur. That's what a catalyst does. It facilitates and allows that reaction to happen, typically at an appreciable rate. Right? A lot of reactions just occur, but they may not occur fast enough for us. So we can add something to it to help it go faster. In this case, it's iron. So sometimes you, and this is, you'll love that, sometimes we'll show catalysts above reaction arrows. Okay? Because they're reactants or products. And if we showed them on the reactant side, we'd have to show them on the product side. So why? Let's just show them both above the arrow. Okay? Not always. Depending on what chemistry you're at, you will see catalysts show up in a variety of different locations, which is why typically, if we were going to say iron was a catalyst, we would write Fe, and you'll notice I already put it down below. Cat for catalyst. Now I know specifically what it's doing. Okay. So that whole writing a reagent above the arrow or below the arrow is not the greatest thing to remember. The last thing on that chart, we have NR for no reaction. I would recommend that you don't ever write NR. Okay? You should always go through, predict your products, balance your reactions, do all that fun thought and work and effort behind it, and then evaluate if that reaction should have occurred. Okay? And if it shouldn't have occurred, then you can say NR. The reason being, most students will jump to the NR without having done all the thought process and will have written it incorrectly. Okay. So spend the effort to go through, predict your reactions um, by writing them down, and then if they don't work, then you can later write NR. Okay? All good? I'm noticing lots of handwriting, so I'm guessing this is all old material. What happens during a chemical change? Okay. Proust comes in, comes up with this law of definite composition, okay. meaning if I take an individual compound, the elements within it will stay a constant proportion by mass. Okay. Why did he say constant proportion by mass? Well, that was the only thing he could observe at that time frame. Okay. We didn't have the ability to look at protons, neutrons, or electrons, or the number of elements, or the number of atoms. All we could say is that when we ran a reaction and I could separate them out, that the mass ratio was always the same. Okay? That's super exciting and fun that we probably won't ever use again. So Dalton goes through, almost Dalton goes through. How does this end up getting measured? <clears throat> we can take a compound and we can decompose it into its constituent parts. So I can heat... Uh, why am I doing potassium chlor uh, perchlorate? And if I heat that up, it will turn into potassium chloride and oxygen. I now have a way of determining those masses. I can then backtrack how much the ratio was in the original starting material. And you might say, well, isn't that a bit tedious? Yes, but we've used these kind of techniques to build and understand what larger structures were 
four centuries. The biggest one is using a combustion reaction. I can take virtually any organic compound of carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen, and sometimes oxygen, and I can react that with a ton of oxygen gas. That produces things according to a balanced equation. I can then trap those individual things, determine masses, and back calculate how much carbon was present, how much hydrogen was present, how much nitrogen, how much oxygen. That is a tedious process, and we have much better techniques now. They're just expensive. Mm -hmm. right? So we tend to not use that kind of technique as much anymore, but it is possible to determine these masses or these mass ratios. Dalton comes along and further manipulates Proust's theories uh, into our atomic theories. Okay? So let's go through these because you've now had practice with these. An element is composed of tiny, indivisible, indestructible particles called atoms. Is this true? Yes. We might give it a, a partially true, which is partially true. Atoms. We have atoms. <laughs> That's about it. Good job. Okay. We have this tiny thing that I'm going to call atoms. Yes, we've stuck with that. What part is not true? They're not indestructible. Okay. What can we destruct them down into? Neutrons, protons, electrons. We've got our subatomic particles. That's why we call them subatomic, because we hadn't actually discovered them. We had assumed atoms were the smallest things. And we said, oh, atoms are the smallest thing by definition. Oh, we're wrong. So we have subatomic particles. And we said those were the su smallest things until what happened? We proved we were wrong, and so we then had sub subatomic particles. Yeah, isn't that awesome? You don't need to worry about those, so don't stress. Two, all atoms of an element are identical and have the same properties. True or false? False. false. Okay, why? Isotopes. I can take two different carbon atoms and they can have different masses. They don't have the same properties. They will act very, very, very similar, but their mass is slightly different. Okay? So rule two is invalid as well. Rule three. I was going to read it out, and then I realized I should probably write stuff down. So we had subatomic particles up here. What was the next one? Isotopes. Things that invalidated. Rule three, atoms of different elements combined to form compounds. Yeah, I can take hydrogen and oxygen. I'm going to put them together, and I can make water. Right? Compounds contain atoms in small whole number ratios. Yes, true. yes, to make water, I need two hydrogens and one oxygen atom. Right? I have whole number ratios. I will never get fractional, or fractional <coughs> atoms going into a compound. That can't happen. Okay? Uh, atoms can combine in more than one ratio to form different compounds. Yes. True. Right. Guy walked into a bar, guy and his friend walked into a bar. First one asked the bartender, I'll have H2O, and then I'll have H2O2. And only one of them survives, right? H2O2, hydrogen peroxide. Don't drink that. Yes, you can shake your head. That's okay. okay. That's not my joke, so I don't take any credit for that. So, chemical reaction. Let's take a look at one. So, here we go. We've got a chemical reaction. Where's the arrow? Oh, I didn't give you an arrow. Yeah, what are we looking at? Everybody's favorite from math classes, right? Word problems. Guess what you get to do? Word problems. Okay? Everything we're going to do is word problems. Okay? This is our simplest level. We have to convert the English language into the symbols that we use for chemistry. And before you go, well, that's way too difficult, you've already done this. What is the chemistry language for solid? S. S. What is the chemistry language for sodium? Na. Na. Okay, you have this already. You're starting to now layer this into it. So let's go through and start to put this together. We have sodium hydride. So sodium, we said, was Na. What is hydride? 
heard a couple things. I heard OH. What is OH? Hydroxoxide. This just says hydride. It is just hydrogen. What phase is this? That's way too big, by the way. Solid. What phase is it? How do you know it's a solid? It says solid. It says solid. That is a very good answer. Thank you. That's right. Reacts with? Uh, plus. Plus. Acetic acid. So think easy first. AQ, yes, I'll accept that. <clears throat> well, that's at the end, so I need something easier first. H. Okay. Now we got the tricky part. Acetic acid is coming from acetate. We need to know the chemical formula for acetate. And you might be like, well, I hope I don't have to remember that. That's on the list of things I told you you need to memorize. So, yes, you need to know that. And we know that's aqueous. Okay, to produce. Reaction arrow. Aqueous sodium acetate. Sodium is N-A. Acetate. I always write this too large. C2, H3, O2. And there's our aqueous. Yeah, that's still too large. I'm going to have to drop down below. Plus H. Just H? We'll come back to that. Oxygen, hydrogen, what? Get rid of the two for the moment. I know you're, you're right. We'll come back to it. What else? Gas. G. So we now have the basic tenets of our equation down. For those of you looking at this, well, it's not right. I know. We need to go through and make sure our equation is correct. That means evaluating each and every single one of those formulas that we've just drawn and making sure it is valid. How do we decide if it is valid? Check the charge. Thank you. What is the charge on sodium? A plus one. What is the charge on hydride? Negative one. Interesting. Isn't hydrogen a plus one, though? Hydrogen ion is absolutely a plus one. Is that hydrogen ion? No, it's hydride ion. Hydrogen's a tricky element. Sometimes it'll be positive or negative. If it is positive, we will call it a hydrogen ion. If it is negative, we will call it hydride, okay, with the IDE ending, like we would with all of our standard nonmetals. Is our charge balanced there? Yes. And the next one, we have hydrogen ion and acetate. What is the charge on hydrogen ion? And acetate. Minus one. It's the charge balanced. Yes. Next one, we have sodium and acetate. What's the charge on sodium? Charge on acetate. Is our charge balanced? Yes. What is the charge on hydrogen? I heard a plus one. What's written in the upper right-hand corner? Hmm. Well, maybe I should just put a plus one. Except what are we supposed to be producing when we put our names together? Equal neutral charges. So can that hydrogen be plus one? No. It must be neutral. It must have no charge, which then begs the next question. Is that formula correct? No. no. For it to be correct, what do I need? H2. It must be H2. Okay. Why? Some elements, uh, and if you want to look at it this way, some elements are so reactive that they cannot exist on their own. Okay. They're lonely. They need a partner. So if we're going to draw them in a potential state where they are all by themselves with no other elements, they must be partnered with a like element. It must be written as H2. Okay. And if I remember correctly, 
Yeah. We have seven of those such elements. They are referred to as the diatomic elements because di stands for two. Right, so if we're looking at our diatomic elements, hydrogen happens to be one of them, which means whenever I draw hydrogen by itself, it must be written as H2. Okay, well, there's seven, so I have to memorize all seven. We've got hydrogen, we have nitrogen, we have oxygen, we have fluorine, we have chlorine, we have bromine, we have iodine. Interesting feature about fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. Where are they? They're all halogens. They're all in the same row. Okay? They are all predicted to have the same kind of balance of their structure. So there's a variety of ways that you could go through and memorize this. There are seven of them. So I've seen a couple people do this. Well, there's nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, which would highlight how many elements? Nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine highlights... Six. But we said there's supposed to be seven. Oh, that's right. I forgot. Hydrogen. There we go. The shape tells me there's seven, but I only highlighted six, so there's got to be an extra one. There's hydrogen. That kind of works. Mm -hmm. Okay. With that highlighting, as I've got it drawn, we have kind of the hockey stick and the puck. Some people like that one. Okay. The one that I personally grew up with and remembered very well was have no fear of ice cold beer. Why did you remember it so well? I can't answer that. <laughs> Hydrogen, nitrogen, fluorine, oxygen, iodine, chlorine, bromine. It is not perfect because beer begins with B. Are there multiple elements that begin with B? Yes. Okay. It gets close. It's not perfect, but it gets pretty close. Yes. But I'd be afraid of ice cold bread. <laughs> so, <laughs> so any way you remember it, you got to get those nailed down. Okay, you have to know those. Yes, Brooke. Do they have different charges, and that's why they stick together? Or do they have the same charges? Don't bring okay. charge into it. Because <laughs> yeah, the charge isn't going to match up. Okay. Hydrogen's charges. Oh, I see what you're saying. In the compound. Yeah. Um, don't bring that into it either. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, you'll just want to memorize it this way. Because officially, what is the charge in hydrogen in hydrogen gas? Zero. So with this, because I was writing for the most part, with this we're saying that all these um, elements have charge two. None of these elements are charged. None of these are charged as drawn. But if I take a look at... I uh, uh, can't do that. It's not drawn up there. If I take a look at... Let's erase some of that. Sodium oxide. What is the charge on oxygen? It's minus two. So when we're saying oxygen does not have a charge... I'm not saying oxygen doesn't have a charge everywhere. I'm saying oxygen does not have a charge when it is only bound to oxygen. Then it has no charge. The instant I bond it to something other than oxygen, it's going to change. Okay. Kind of make sense? Okay. These are called our diatomic molecules. Which might be better said diatomic elements, but mm, yep, I didn't think I wanted to do that. So, any questions about that equation? Everybody good with it? You got those seven now memorized? Okay. Which gets us to the next one: balancing chemical equations. When we write out a chemical equation, not only do we have to make sure every single one of our groups of elements is correct, and we have the proper formula. But we now also have to make sure that we haven't invalidated one of those rules that came out of Chapter 3, okay? primarily being the conservation of matter. 
which means when I go through and run this reaction, I can change where the sodium is associated, but I cannot get rid of sodium. It must still be there. Right? So I have to do that with every single element. So I need to come up with a way to balance the chemical equation to ensure, or to at least check to make sure that it's drawn correctly. So if we go through and look at it, what do you guys think? Is this balanced? So we heard yeses and noes, which means we should probably come up with a method. Let's go through and take a look at sodium. How many sodiums are there on the left-hand side? One. On the right-hand side? One. How many hydrogens on the left-hand side? Four. Four. Ah, this got a little bit tricky. There's one here, there's one here, and there's three there. There are five. How many hydrogens on the right-hand side? Five. Whoops, that's supposed to be a three. Three and two, and we have five. How many carbons on the left-hand side? And the right hand? And oxygens? Two and two. So we're going through and looking at each and every single element and checking how many total up on each side of the equation. As long as those numbers are the same for both, what do we need to do? <coughs> Nothing. It's done. It's perfect. It's beautiful. Right. What kind of question could I ask about this equation then? Okay. I could say balance the chemical equation. Okay. But it's a multiple choice test. How do I ask that? I could do is it balanced. That could be a fun one. But then it's only true false. That's a bad question. So I could say which of the following five equations is balanced? Okay. Fair game. Absolutely fair game. You could go through each and every single one of those to to check to make sure it's balanced. What else could I ask? Which one's not balanced? Isn't it? Always do the inverse. When balanced, uh, or how many sodiums are necessary to balance the equation? Ooh, interesting. How'd you get two? So did I need two sodiums? No, I only needed one, because the one over here is the one over here. So I can't add those up. Okay, so I can say I needed one sodium to go through and balance the equation. Okay. I could say, what is the coefficient in front of hydrogen gas? So I might have given you enough context to figure that one out. The coefficient, what am I saying with the coefficient? The number in front of our hydrogen gas. So you've got to find our hydrogen gas. What's the number in front? One. one. So the answer is one. one. Last way I can ask it, which is usually the one that people get thrown by, what is the sum of the coefficients of the balanced equation? What is the sum of the coefficients of the balanced equation? What is the number, the coefficient for sodium hydride? What is the coefficient for acetic acid? What is the coefficient for sodium acetate? One. What is the coefficient for hydrogen? One. Add those up and we get four. Lots of different ways I can ask the question, all looking at the exact same thing. Make sense? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, so that was kind of a boring one, right? Because everything was balanced. What happens if it wasn't balanced? Okay. What we would do is change the coefficient in front. Okay, what is the issue for changing the coefficient in front? What if I change the coefficient in front of sodium acetate? That changes the sodium, but it also changes the carbon, the hydrogen, and the oxygen. By putting a 2 there, how many sodiums are present now on the right-hand side? How many carbons? How many hydrogens? Oxygens? Four. Everybody get that? Okay. So we have to be very careful with that. So some people will say, well, but I only want two sodiums. And this is a, this is a hypothetical situation because it was bound. So if I only want two sodiums, then I'm going to make this sodium two acetate. What's the problem with doing that? 
That two now only applies to the sodium. It doesn't have any other effect. Uh, it's not even octets. The charge. Okay. Remember, to produce our molecule, we had to make sure it was neutral charge. If I have two sodiums, what is now the charge on sodium acetate? Well, there's a plus one from the first sodium, plus a second one from the second sodium, minus one from the acetate, and my charge becomes plus one. Is my formula now correct? No. Do not touch the subscripts. The reason we have subscripts is to make sure we have a correct formula. If you've done your work, you have a correct formula, don't mess with them. The only thing you can change once you've started to balance an equation is the coefficient in front. And yes, that may make your life more difficult because you're now changing the numbers of all the other elements, which means what do you have to do? You have to go back and check all those elements and make sure they balance out again. Okay. <coughs> So, let's take a look at some rules. Yes, this is a lot of rules, but they aren't that bad. Right? So, the first two rules are kind of, or kind of a bit premature. Number one, predict your products. Right? Sometimes you're expected to predict the products, sometimes you're not. You're just expected to just balance whatever you're given. Right? To predict those products, you would need to classify the type of reaction. And you all know the types of reactions because you watched the video. Good. Step number two, we need to balance our formulas. So this is not the equation. That means looking at each of your individual species and say, did I make a neutral structure? If it is not neutral, don't balance the equation because it will fail. Balance your formula first. Make sure your formula is correct. Then you can move forward. Okay? Once you've got that, then you can balance your equation. You will start with any atom, any atom you want, sort of, Except hydrogen and oxygen. Any ideas why we should leave hydrogen and oxygen alone? Where is oxygen? Yes, pointing at the periodic table works. <gasps> Everywhere. Which means if I look at an equation, where does oxygen show up? Multiple places on both sides of the equation. So if I'm trying to balance out the oxygen and I change one number, did I change the right position? I don't know. So I want to leave oxygen alone because it shows up in so many different places. Because what I'm going to hope for is that I can balance the equation based off the other elements and I don't have to worry about dealing with oxygen showing up in multiple different locations. Same deal with hydrogen. Okay? There are cases where other elements will show up in multiple places. If they do show up in multiple places, leave them for last. Right? Hope and pray that you don't have to worry about them. Right? After that, you'll go through and continue to balance out by placing whole numbers in front of your formula okay, to increase the amount of all atoms in that formula. Okay? But ideally, what you're adjusting are the numbers of that particular element. You can then balance it out on both sides. Next step. You move to the next atom, and the next atom, and the next atom. Okay. The next step, okay, which is what most people tend to skip, which is why people get it wrong. And you won't get it wrong because you have this step, and you're not going to skip it. Check your work. You will go back, and you will start with the very first element you did, and you will check how many times it shows up on both sides of the equation. You'll move to the next element, you'll check both times, and you'll check both times. You may need to cycle through your checking of your work several times. That's good. If you start cycling through and you're constantly changing, you've changed a number multiple times, more than likely you screwed something up, erase your work, try again. Okay, where should you start from? The very beginning. Not even looking at hydrogen and oxygen. I mean all the way back to predicting products. Because typically, if you're cycling through and constantly changing numbers, what happened is you screwed up step one or step two. And you've now gotten into a cycle where there is no way to balance the equation because it's an equation that doesn't exist. Mm -mm. Right? So go back, check your products, make sure your formulas are correct, and then you can start your balancing process again. Okay? 
<clears throat> the last thing you should do, just in case, is verify that you use the smallest whole numbers possible. Right? Typically, if you've gone through this method, you won't have to worry about that, but sometimes that pops up. Make sure you've got the smallest numbers. Same deal with our ionic formulas, right? Okay. Questions about that? I people, see people shaking their head yes, which then makes me wonder what the question is, but then you're just not asking. So let's practice. <clears throat> let's take a look at that first one. Hydrogen gas plus oxygen gas goes to water or liquid water. So if I was to go through and balance, start with any other element other than oxygen and hydrogen, and oh, well, that's all I got. Mm -hmm. right? So and if we take a look, it doesn't show up multiple times on both cases, so it doesn't matter which element I pick. I will pick hydrogen to start. How many times does hydrogen show up on the left-hand side? Twice. And on the right-hand side? Twice, which means hydrogen's balanced. I'll then move to oxygen. How many times does oxygen show up on the left-hand side? And on the right-hand side? Once. Remember we said whole numbers. Every so often you'll see somebody drop in a half. Is a half a whole number? No. So that doesn't count. Don't do it. Okay. I need 2 to equal 1, and I can do that by changing the coefficient in front. Which coefficient am I going to change, left or right? I'll change the right by making it a 2. Now what happens to the oxygens on the right-hand side of the equation? Becomes 2. Notice the method I've used. Again, same style. Elements right underneath the reaction arrow, numbers of elements on each side. Anytime I make a change, I put a line through that what was written and draw the new number. Okay? What step do I move to now? I need to check my work. Okay? I went through and balanced. Hydrogen was balanced, oxygen's balanced. I now go back and I check. How many hydrogens on the left hand side? How many hydrogens on the right hand side? There's two and two, meaning I have four. It is now not balanced. So I have to change the coefficients. I can do that by doing what, Sydney? Put a two in front of that one. Now what happens? I have two H2s. Those multiply, I get four. I'd have four hydrogens on the left-hand side of the equation, four hydrogens on the right-hand side of the equation. Now what do I do? Oxygen. How many oxygens on the left-hand side? How many oxygens on the right-hand side? Two. Now what do I do? Check it again. How many hydrogens on the left-hand side? How many hydrogens on the right-hand side? How many oxygens on the right-hand side? On the left hand? Two. Now what do I do? You check it again. Okay. At this stage in the game, what I want you to get out of balancing is I want you to check so many times that you are actively angry at me for telling you to check it that many times. I feel like you're pulling numbers out of thin air. Like, it doesn't really make sense. Okay, we'll come back to that in just a second. You need to go through and check that many times. Believe it or not, you bring emotion into it, what's going to happen? You're going to remember it. So if you check it often enough where you're actually mad at me, that will help you remember this process. Don't check it so often that you're mad enough to do damage to me, but check it enough that you're mad at me. That's what I want. Okay, yes, and then we'll come back to you, Jerry. Um, do we need to put a one? Or can we? Uh, I'll come back to that. Okay. So let's slowly go back through this again. We'll start with hydrogen. How many hydrogens? Let's be tricky this time. Let's go to the right-hand side. That 2 as a, cof or as a subscript only applies to what's directly in front of it. So there are two hydrogens on the right-hand side. How many hydrogens on the left-hand side? There are only two. Move to oxygen. How many oxygens on the left-hand side? Two. Two. How many oxygens on the right-hand side? One. There's only one. 
those coefficients or those numbers must be identical. Otherwise, we've gotten ourselves a Nobel Prize. Okay? So how do I make them identical? What happens if I made this a two? How many hydrogen or how many oxygens would be on the left hand side? Four. Am I closer to them being equal or further? I'm further from it. So changing that number was a very bad idea. I want to change the number on the right hand side. Let's change it to three. How many on the right hand side now? Three. Three versus two. Am I balanced? No. What am I doing? I'm literally guessing at a number, throwing it in there and saying, did it balance? Three didn't work. How can I make two and one equal to each other? Multiply that one by two. How many oxygens are on the right-hand side now? Oxygens? Two. If we think back to the hydrogen... The hydrogen had two hydrogen, or there were two hydrogens in water, but I had two water molecules. Remember, the coefficient is referencing how many of that unit you have. If I have two water molecules, and each of those water molecules has two hydrogens, so there's one, and there's two. How many hydrogens are represented in that? Four. How many hydrogens, are, and then that changes our number down here. That must be four. How many hydrogens are on the left-hand side? Only two. That needs to be four for this to balance. What do I have to do? Two in front. I will not touch the subscript because that changes the compound. That gets me to four again. Now I've got four and four. Officially, I would check the oxygen. We should see that that's two and two. You need more help, practice, and then talk to me after class. Okay? So now the next question that Aspen was asking, what could I potentially ask here? Okay, she asked somebody, do I need to include the one in front of the oxygen? Not really. Well, let's take a look at some multiple choice answers here. Uh, let's actually go sequence one. What's the question I'm asking to match those answers? A variety of answers could work for this. The question I want to ask is, what is the sum of the coefficients? So this is going to come down to what you want to do. So number one, take a look at the answer choices. A happens to match the number in front of oxygen. B happens to match... The number in front of hydrogen. C happens to match the sum of the molecules. D happens to match. We could go to the number of hydrogens. I would argue it's an easier one or a more difficult one. Back to Aspen's question. What if you didn't include the coefficient in front of that O2? Most people tend to ignore it, and the sum of the coefficients becomes... Four. Yes. <laughs> Is it necessary to include the one? No, and you will find most chemists do not include that one. You are trying to learn and make sure that you can become a chemist. You're going to have to go through some of that practice. Your answer in that case becomes E5. And again, why is this a particularly tricky question? Every single one of your multiple choice answers has validity back to the answer. You must answer the question that's asked. If I ask for the sum of the coefficients of the balanced equation, the answer is 5. So if you weren't specifically asking about the coefficients, would it be 4? It, depends, it all depends on the question that's asked. Right? So with that, go ahead and try and balance the next equation and uh, actually the next two. I'll leave all of my work up there in case you want to follow it, but balance the next two because it's kind of fast, so I kind of apologize for that. For that second equation, all you need to do is draw a two in front of the HBR. That was it, and now everything's balanced out. 
For the next one, you might have had some trouble with that. Okay, some people are laughing. At, okay. So, and here's what I would bet on why you had trouble with that. Okay, you probably said, okay, aluminum. How many aluminums? Two. Two and one. Is that balanced? What do you need to do? We need a two in front of the one on the right. So I now have two aluminums. And now you're like, well, well, there's still a lot of other things in there. What do I want to balance now? Well, remember, it can be anything you want. Should it be oxygen? No. No, oxygen shows up in way too many places, so skip oxygen. Okay? Uh, and because I'm cross-eyed, I'm going to move to barium. How many bariums are on the left? How many bariums on the right? One. One. It's barium balanced. Yeah. yeah, okay. Now, <clears throat> even if I'm cross-eyed, I have a problem. But I have a hard time like dissociating complex things. How many sulfates on the left? How many sulfates on the right? Does it balance? What do I need to do? Bear with me. Nitrates on the left? Nitrates on the right? Nitrates on the right? Six. Yes, you have three nitrates, but you have two of those sets. Are those balanced? What do you need to do? Now what do we do? Check it all again. Aluminum. Two and barium. Three N, three sulfate. Three N, three nitrate. Six N, six. It's balanced. Okay. We are officially kind of out of time, but I heard some people kind of saying, "But wait, why did I jump to sulfate instead of sulfur?" They're together already. They are not always together. But if I have a complex ion and it does not change from left to right, guess what I can do? I can keep it as one unit and balance across. Do I have to? No. I can still balance based off the elements, but it makes life miserable. Put them into the polyatomic ions, it'll make life a little bit easier. With that, we're done if you guys.